Hello, everyone, and welcome on behalf of the College of Arts and Sciences. Uh, I am Elizabeth Falter. I am the Digital Media Specialist in the Department of English, and I will be serving as your moderator today. Uh, thank you so much for joining us for Book Club. Uh, today, we will discuss The Underground Railroad by Colson Whitehead, selected by Department of English leaders and faculty. A uh, big thank you to Elizabeth Hewitt, Professor and Director of Undergraduate Studies in the Department of English, and Jim Phelan, Distinguished University Professor in the Department of English and Director of Medical Humanities and Director of Project Narrative for sharing their expertise with us today. Uh, Elizabeth and Jim will get us started with some remarks about the Underground Railroad, and we'll then open up the conversation to your questions and comments. Uh, so Jim, take it away. Hi, everyone. Uh, thanks for coming. Um, it's really a pleasure to be here to uh, talk with you and with Beth about this really, I think, important and um, timely book. And I'll start by, you know, sort of noting that its genre is one of a, the, that of the historical novel. That's one of the genres it's working with. Beth will talk about some of the others. Um, but one of the, the couple features of the historical novel that I think are important to um, sort of highlight um, at the outset, um, one is that the historical novel typically looks to make some connection between the history um, that it's writing about and the time of the writing. So 2017, Underground Railroad, um, issues of uh, you know, the history uh, and legacy of slavery in the United States. Um, very much, I think, um, Whitehead is, is sort of thinking about, okay, the past and the present, and there are various ways in which I think um, we can see him doing that. Um, one of the other things I want to sort of highlight initially is the kind of organization of the book and some of the issues of organization in connection with the idea of uh, him uh, writing in the genre of the historical novel, among others. Now, you'll notice, and just look at the table of contents, that uh, what he does is he alternates chapters, right? And at chapter titles, we have the names of um, uh, characters and then we have place names right so we start with a character's name we go to a place name or jari georgia etc um, and one of the things that that does i think that's really interesting is it sort of gives us a central thread right with cora and her quest uh, to find freedom uh, via the underground railroad etc um, and then it also provides further context um, for Cora's quest and also further, further context for people who are central to that, right? Um, then, you know, one of the things that I'm interested in as a, as a narrative theorist is the way in which narratives progress, right? So sort of what's the logic um, as we move from beginning to middle to end. And one of the things I talk about is that um, there's a logic, sort of an internal textual dynamics logic, right? So we talk about instability. You know, so a major instability, Cora's enslaved, right? And then she, complication, Caesar says, okay, well, let's, you know, let's escape, right? Um, and, and everything falls from that complications and finally we get to some kind of resolution. Right, at, but it, accompanying that textual dynamics is a kind of readerly dynamics, right? So what are we interested in? What kind of expectations do we have? Um, what kind of hopes do we have? What kind of desires, et cetera? Um, and I think one of the things that, that's really interesting about what Whitehead does with his organization and you know, this way of doing the historical novel between the central thread and context is that he does something pretty unusual and striking with the readerly dynamics of the chapters having to do with the people, right? And in particular, right, we think about, okay, he's got, we've got a jar, so we get backstory, 
Um, we got Ridgeway, which is okay, setting up, you know, the complication of, okay, Cora and Caesar make their break and Ridgeway is gonna be the slave catcher. Uh, Stevens, Ethel, we get more info about these people um, who show up along the Cora's way. But then when we get to, to Caesar, um, he starts to do something different uh, because in terms of in terms of the readerly dynamics. Because with the Caesar chapter, he, uh, Whitehead kind of takes us over ground that we've already seen, right? and that hasn't happened with Ridgeway or Stevens or Ethel, and. And in doing that, there's a kind of repetition, right? But there's a repetition with a difference. And there's a kind of expansion of the central, uh, you know, the central thread with Cora in the sense that we get uh, Caesar's perspective on it uh, as they're starting out. Um, and then I think even more striking uh, in terms of the variation and the consequences for um, readerly dynamics is the Mabel chapter. And here I'll just say one thing about, um, one other thing about textual dynamics. So in the, in the textual dynamics, we have obviously the, you know, instability complication and further complication of the, you know, the quest for freedom. But there's also this issue, right, that's very central for Cora, which is my mother. Mabel, what happened to Mabel, right? Um, and it's also important, obviously, for Ridgeway, right? Uh, he's kind of obsessed with Cora because he was never able to, to find Mabel. So this has become an issue for Cora, and it's also an issue then for, for readers, right? And then in, the, in that chapter uh, with Mabel, and if we have more time, we we'll go and maybe look at some of the uh, particulars of the way uh, Whitehead um, represents her and what happens. But for now, I just want to talk about how he, he is varying the pattern and the consequences of that for readerly dynamics in particular, right? So he tells us what happens to Mabel. And we learn she escaped. She has a moment in which she feels free, right? And then, you know, she, and then she decides to go back for her daughter, right? And then she gets bitten by the snake and you know, she decides to lie down and die, right? Now, what, what's so striking about that to me, I think, is that this is information that we get, readers get, and Cora never does, right? So this issue, which has been an issue for Cora and for Whitehead's audience, gets resolved in a way for the audience um, and not for Cora. And at the same time, he does something really interesting in that chapter, which is that Mabel thinks about what she will tell Cora when she goes back, right? When she decides to go back, right? And she's thinking, okay, well, I'll tell her about this. I'll tell her about a life beyond the plantation. I'll tell her about this feeling of freedom and that will be something that she can aspire to. Right? I'm gonna go back, I can't stay here, but maybe it's possible for her, right? And in fact, that's a big part of the story that we get, right? And Mabel never knows that, right? So we have this kind of interesting double, um, you know, of what we get to know, what Cora doesn't get to know, what Mabel doesn't get to know, what we get to know. And in that regard, I think, and just going back to what I was saying about the historical novel and the way he's doing it, um, I think Whitehead finds this way of working with the patterns and the variations of the patterns with the textual and the readerly dynamics that sort of adds so much to the affective quality of the story that he's telling, right? The emotions that we have in response to being in this place where we know and they don't, right? And, and you know, and, and so it's, it's, he's bringing home in this very powerful way, some of the consequences of what it was like to be Cora, what it was like to be Mabel, 
what they did achieve, what they didn't achieve, what was, you know, what were the limits of what they did, how those limits are all connected to the whole system of enslavement and its connection to King Cotton and, and all those things. Um, so we have this historical novel, which is telling us a lot about the history of enslavement and what it was like. And then, you know, in his handling of particular characters and the kinds of things that there, it's possible for them and then the kinds of disclosures that he gives us about them, I think he really you know, makes it land so very, very powerfully. Um, and I, I find the thing, I find the novel tremendously moving. Um, and, and to some degree, the Mabel chapter is a, you know, a high point of that. Then we, we could talk about the North, but I think I'll, I'll stop there and uh, turn it over to Beth. Hi. <clears throat> um, again, thank you all for coming and, and listening to us talk. Um, I'm going to also talk a little bit about, about genre, and then, um, and then um, hopefully I will also am reading questions as they come in, and eventually we'll also get to those questions as well. So I, I've really been enchanted by Colson Whitehead um, and his work since I read his first novel, um, which some of you may have read, The Intuitionist which is a story of a young woman who's caught up in a conspiracy um, between rival theories of elevator inspection. And it coupled the fantastic and the realist for me, it, like nothing I had ever really read before. Um, and I read a lot of science fiction. Um, and, and I've often thought that that novel, which was published in 1999, so it's really like, I think of it as being the first great novel of the 21st century, was at the vanguard of what, what I see as this, the kind of generic innovation that I find in the best fiction of the 21st century, which has this increasingly a tendency to blend popular genres um, I think here science fiction, um, fantasy, mystery, horror, with what we think of as being more prestigious literary genres like um, historical fiction, psychological realism, the buildings Roman. And I think Whitehead um, deploys the same generic versatility in the Underground Railroad. And what happens is we, we have a book that, that for me offers something almost like a crash course in the intersections between the history of the novel, largely, um, the history of African-American literature and the history of American racism. So what I wanted to do was start maybe at a, at a, a, a place in the novel that happens towards the um, end. It's just a small moment where we learn that Caesar, oh, it's, it's one of those chapters that Jim was talking about, the Caesar chapter, where we find out that as he is planning to escape or making the decision to escape with Cora, he's also reading Gulliver's Travels. Um, and he's warned against the dangers of, of being caught with a book. Um, Fletcher is the one who is, who's, who's given him the book, but he nevertheless takes the risk of reading it because um, the novel writes, if he didn't read, he was a slave. And Whitehead's novel there um, establishes a familiar correlation between literacy and emancipation that we see really throughout African-American literature. But I was also struck by the choice of Gulliver's um, Travels as the, as the title, um, because it's a work that's often identified by literary historians as an origin point in the larger history of the novel. Gulliver's Adventures, amongst remote nations, that's the subtitle of the book, established really a template for, or one of the templates for the picaresque novel that really dominates the English language um, novel. Um, novels like Tom Jones, Jane Eyre, Huckleberry Finn, um, Catcher in the Rye, um, maybe not Catcher in the Rye so much, um, um, uh, On the Road. <laughs> um, and critics frequently identify or locate Underground Railroad, Colson Whitehead's Underground Railroad in this literary genealogy. Um, they call, the, uh, many of the reviews identify it as a picaresque novel in which Cora, like Gulliver, moves from one horrible um, encounter to the next. And in fact, even in the novel, um, I honestly didn't notice this until the last, the most recent time I've read it, uh, Gloria Valentine even calls Cora the, the adventurous. Um, 
So in literary history, there's also a very close relationship between the picaresque novel and the Black, Black Atlantic captivity narrative, um, which is the, the term that we often use to refer to the autobiographies of uh, formerly enslaved people who, who in their autobiographies or in their narratives recollect the Middle Passage and also their life in American slavery. And I feel like Whitehead himself alludes to that genre when he makes the decision to open the Underground Railroad with Cora's grandmother's approach to the African coast, um, where she's forced onto the slave ship that is going to uh, bring her to America. And so, which made me realize all of a sudden that, that in some sense there are three generation three generations of female picaresque heroes in the Underground Railroad, three adventuresses, um, Ajari, Mabel, and Cora. They have different kinds of journeys, but they all, they all are, we, we get all of their, their voyages. But the, in thinking about the picaresque, it occurred to me that while Whitehead's novel invokes that history, it also really reveals the inadequacies of that particular literary form. And he, he does that actually within the context of the novel when Caesar explicitly criticizes the genre. Caesar compares himself to Gulliver and he, and he I'm quoting from the novel here, he says, that was white people all over, make a home, then keep straying. If Caesar figured the route home, he'd never travel again. And Caesar's observation for me raised a, a really large literary historical question about how adequately this particular novelistic plot, the picaresque, um, the quest, um, the epic, can represent the experiences of, um, of African Americans, of people of the Black diaspora. Caesar, Cora, Ajeri, Mabel, um, none of them can really leave or return home because they cannot possess a home. Slavery has made them perpetually displaced, um, the door of no return. It would seem then that the plot of an episodic journey necessarily signifies differently for people of the Black diaspora. And I think Whitehead means to draw attention to the limitations of conventional literary genres, literary forms, to paint the lives of his characters, of Cora, Caesar, and millions of others. Um, and like Jim, I also started thinking about this in relationship to historical fiction and why it is that uh, the Underground Railroad seems to invert the kind of what I think of as being the standard rules of historic fiction. So in most, and Jim talked about this a little bit, um, and I don't mean to repeat it, but I just, it strikes me as being really interesting that in most historical novels, authors are very free to invent their protagonists, their characters, but they're, they're compelled to stay true to the authenticity of historical personages. Um, so the best example I can think of is in War and Peace, Tolstoy can invent all sorts, he can invent the main characters of the novel, but the invading French emperor needs to be, um, needs to be Napoleon Bonaparte. And Whitehead in many ways is, is like Tolstoy in, in that he strives for kind of really, really strict historical accuracy in his novel. Um, the book's acknowledgments um, testify to his, his really scrupulous study of antebellum uh, newspapers, of abolitionist um, writing. Of, in particular, he singles out the narratives, um, all the autobiographical narratives of Frederick Douglass and Harriet Jacobs and then the Federal Writers Project's collection of um, emancipated people's life stories. Um, all of these are, are uh, you know, this enormous archive of material that he takes from so that he could bring to life the characters who are at the heart of his novel. Um, so for example, um, between each of the chapters, we have the, um, or excuse me, not between each of the chapters, but before each of the place chapters, the ones that are named after states, there are escaped slave notices. Um, and he it tells us in the acknowledgments that he takes those directly from historical, um, the historical archives, save for the last one um, about which we could talk more. Um, but for all this dedication to verisimil verisimilitude, many of the gestures that he makes towards historical realism are really quite impressionistic. Um, so for example, we know that the novel is set after the Fugitive Slave Act because that's mentioned in the novel and we know it starts before the Civil War. So we know it's between 1850 and 1861, but that's actually a pretty wide temporal window when you compare it to most other historical fictions. 
which are usually located in a really precise time. War and Peace is set in 1806, for example. Um, and in fact, there are very few references to real historical people and events, other than the names of the geographical places, the, the state titles, and the Fugitive Slave Act. There are only, that I could find, three references to historical proper names. Um, the enslaved man at the beginning, uh, Michael, uh, recites the Declaration of Independence. So there's the reference to the Declaration of Independence, which could, and that actually is referenced a couple times. Caesar reads Gulliver's Travels, and there's actually a quotation from Gulliver. And then Cora discovers the library on the Valentine farm and, and effectively becomes a scholar of the African-American literary tradition. Um, uh, as a scholar, as, a, as someone who reads and teaches and, and writes about African American literature, I, I need to read the passage to you because I like it so much. Um, she's in the library and it says, pamphlets of verse by Negro poets, autobiographies of colored orators, Phyllis Wheatley and Jupiter Hammond. There was a man named Benjamin Banneker who composed almanacs. Almanacs, Cora devoured them all. So there we have one, two, three actual real people named. And I was intrigued that Whitehead provided the details there, um, wondering if it perhaps suggested that this African-American literary history is the one to which both he and Cora want to pledge their faith. Um, and especially when you compare these detailed names and titles with the large liberties that Whitehead takes with other kinds of historical details, um, most notably, of course, in the novel's central conceit that the, the metaphoric Underground Railroad, which is to say the network of people um, and homes used to, to help people escape from slavery, he takes that, that notion of the metaphoric Underground Railroad and he turns it into a real subterranean transportation system. That deviation from the historically real is why critics frequently, or maybe not frequently, but I've heard it used before, they talk about the novel as what's called slipstream fiction, um, which is a term that um, there's some controversy about when exactly the term is invented, but it's used to describe a particular blend of, of realism and fantasy. Um, I always think about the slipstream as something like a the metaphor I always use to describe it when I'm talking to students is it's like a circus mirror. It reflects reality as distortion. Um, and in the Underground Railroad, I experience it honestly most vividly when Cora emerges from the first station in South Carolina and she sees a skyscraper in the middle of the 19th century. Um, I'm going to read the sentence to you because again, it's quite remarkable. When they stepped, when they next stepped into the sunlight, they were in South Carolina. Cora looked up at the skyscraper and reeled, wondering how far she had traveled. Uh, whenever I read that sentence, I reel too, <laughs> momentarily disoriented, wondering how far both of us have traveled. Has Cora escaped the brutalities of enslavement through time travel? Has the Underground Railroad transported me from the genre of historical realism to speculative fiction? Um, I always think this, <laughs> um, and the answer is always no. Cora remains trapped in her 19th century United States. Uh, true, her 19th century um, is somewhat different than the one in my history books. The first skyscraper isn't really built until 1885. South Carolina never undertakes a, a project to quote unquote reform escaped slaves. Eugenics doesn't begin in earnest until after the end of the Civil War. The Tuskegee experiment doesn't begin until the 20th century. North Carolina never exiled um, Black people from laboring in the state. But these adjustments, I think, are a cornerstone to a larger argument that Whitehead is making about the legacy of slavery and American racism. Um, a Black person can emerge into any place in the United States in any century and neither be really safe nor really free. And so for me, the, 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 the Underground Railroad, the, the way in which he imagines it as a real thing, um, is really is related to his, his playing with genres. The, the railroad provides a hope of both freedom and safety, um, but it's also importantly the inverse um, um, of the rail, the real railroad, the one that act, that really exists in our real world, that's traveling across the United States, um, which was throughout the 19th century an economic dynamo that was largely capitalized um, 
by slavery and and then by um, uh, and and then by um, uh, in effectively um, uh, a peonage. Um, so, and I think I think Cora recognizes this. So underground and en route to Indiana, Cora recalls being told, um, "If you want to see what this nation is all about, you have to ride the rails. Look outside as you speed through, and you'll find the true face of America." Um, but the novel tells us Cora realizes there was only darkness outside the windows on her journey and only ever would be darkness. For me, Whitehead's uh, generic patchwork, the way in which he manipulates the conventions of the novel, is like this underground railroad, um, a conduit for hope, but also um, what I think of as being a sorrowful recognition of how difficult it is for African American people to ride on the above ground rails. Um, so our first question from Susan uh, is actually, I believe, a genre related question uh, related to what you were speaking about, um, Beth, and asking, what is the definition of picaresque? Does it mean episodic? I, I, I really do mean it to mean mostly um, episodic. So the picaresque novel, it, you know, if, if if we were in my English class, then uh, <laughs> I would be telling you that it comes from the Spanish word picaro, um, and it refers to a kind of ordinary hero who goes through a series of adventures. Um, so, and, and in common parlance, um, or at least let's say English English professor parlance, we often use the the picaresque to refer to any any um, any narrative form, Jim, and tell me if you think I'm, I'm wrong here, yeah. uh, any fictional narrative form in which we have a character who goes through a series of adventures in a kind of episodic uh, fashion. Um, right, so it's, right. In, it's in some sense related to the epic because it's often a quest, um, but the way in which it's structured is very much like the Underground Railroad. First, we're in South Carolina, then we're in North Carolina, then we're in, um, well, first we're in Georgia, um, then we're in Tennessee, then we're in Indiana. Right, and I think the, um, one of the things is about the connections between the episodes, right? So you can have a central character who, um, you know, has many adventures, right? But one of the things that I think of as distinguishing the picaresque is that there's not a causal, you know, straight thing with one episode definitely leads to the next, right? So, you know, Huckleberry Finn is probably familiar to many, right? So Huck has, uh, you know, Twain has the device of the Huck and Jim going down the Mississippi River, and then they stop, you know, these different places along the shore, right? So we have an episode in Brickville, you know, and we have an episode with the uh, Grangeford and the Shepherdsons and et cetera, right? So. Yeah. yeah, I mean, part of I, part of the reason I, I I turn to the episodic is because I think that that's part of the effect of the underground part of the railroad is that you're down below and then you come and then you come up. And so it's and honestly, I think I don't I don't recall ever reading Whitehead talk about Huckleberry Finn, but there's a, there's a there's a way in which we can we can imagine that this journey on the underground railroad, it is a kind of echo to Huck and Jim's journey down the river, right? These are, they're both transportation narratives. Right. Um, wonderful. Uh, our next question comes from Judy uh, and she asks, what did you think of this statement? Um, and it's on page 55 in their edition, white men eat you up, but sometimes colored folk eat you up too. For, for me, uh, I'm, but part of this I'm basing on um, reading an interview with Colson Whitehead, um, which is that um, he says when he's drawing when he was drawing the portrait of Cora, there were there were two things that were most important to him, and he he kind of understood them as being in some sense different. One was the that for, that if you remember the the fierce way in which she de she demands she takes the axe and she's like you are not going to take my mother's my mother's farm, you know, the little plot of ground. Um, and then the other is when she um, she basically allows herself to be hurt to, to um, save Chester or to make it so that Chester is hurt less. And 
in, in the interview, he, he essentially says, what I didn't want to do was produce a kind of uncle, when he's, he literally uses the term of the novel, I didn't want to produce an Uncle Tom's Cabin in which everyone who was enslaved was generous and good to one another, um, because I wanted to actually depict slavery as it really would have been, which is a place of incredible um, um, deprivation and scarcity. And so therefore, you know, Cora wants her ground because one, she wants, she thinks of it as something like property, even though she has no property in herself. And of course, it's also connected to her mother. And so it's a way in which she can establish a kind of genealogy and she's willing to do violence in order to get it. I think it's echoed later on when she kills the, you know, when she kills the, the man, the boy who's trying to save her. And so he doesn't want to, the, my feeling is, the sometimes colored folk eat you up too is just him suggesting that when one doesn't have, um, when ha one has no hope, when one has no freedom, um, you just, you're going to eat up anyone who potentially gets in the way of that freedom and hope. That's how, that's how I read that line. Yeah, I, I would agree. I just piggyback on it a little bit that, that in some particular cases, right, I, I think we can see that Sometimes the colored folk are, you know, taking advantage of others because the system almost, you know, forces them to, right? So, so in the Mabel chapter, for example, Mabel thinks back on Moses, right? And how Moses was, um, you know, sort of nursed and nourished by his mother, kept alive and so on, and, and you know, was a gentle kind of soul. And then Conley, the white Irish, you know, overlord, basically, um, sort of recruited him to, to be his kind of right hand. And then Moses became this, you know, sort of figure who carries out the enslavement in some ways and the violence against the uh, enslaved people. And, and so, yeah, he's, he's somebody who's eating them up, but the reason is, you know, because of the whole system. Right, right. Yeah, the other character I think of is in, in that regard, although I, I don't think we, he's, he's a cryptic character to me, is um, Homer. Yeah. Um, who, you know, who, who get the, you know, the, the very last we see Homer, Homer's the one who's going to make it so that the Underground Railroad stop, you know, in Indiana is going to be, it, it's, it's going to be discovered, right? Um, right. And, and we don't really know much about his back history, but there's there would be another example. Um, but, I, but as you say, Jim, I think the suggestion is this isn't about individuals, this is about a larger system um, right. and the way in which it implicates people to eat other people up. Uh, next question comes from Helen. Uh, would you agree that a novel such as this one with its fantastical relating carries a greater weight and makes far more of an impact on our consciousness, emotional empathy, and understanding of what the actual experience was than a factual historical telling? Well, <laughs> I mean, I think it does all those things, right? Um, I worry about the, you know, what seems to me a, a kind of a invidious comparison, right? I mean, that is, it seems to me that um, you can do it You can do it with a with a more uh, you know factual, less fantastic uh, kind of uh, historical novel. They can also you know make it. You can thematize things very well. You can you can have your audience empathize and so on, right? I think you know, maybe just to tweak your question a little bit, it, it would be to say, well, let's think a little bit more about you know why Whitehead did this and what some of the consequences of him doing that are. Um, and, and I think, you know, a lot of what Beth said uh, about the way in which um, his play with, um, you know, invention, um, the, the, one of the things that I sort of, I take away from and want to maybe underline in what Beth said is that this idea of the anachronistic fantastic, right, the, the skyscrapers, the Tuskegee, uh, uh, the change in North Carolina, and so on, 
what he's doing, and I think is very powerful, is really saying, okay, my novel is set in the 1850s, but my novel is about enslavement in the history of the United States. And I'm going to bring in things, I'm going to violate, you know, conventional history. And I think it re works really well, right? Could he have, he could have done something different, I think, and, and stayed, you know, true to the history um, and have it been very effective. Um, so, I, you know, <laughs> I just worry about when we start doing things like, oh, well, this is, got, this is the best, this is better than that, you know. Right. You mean because um, you, could, you could look at something like Beloved, which doesn't, you know, which does right. turn to the fantastical, but not in terms of historical anachronism at all. Right. Um, right. And it also, you know, packs a, a, power, <laughs> a powerful punch. Right. Um, yeah, yeah I, mean, I thought about Beloved, right, but then, you know, what she's doing with the title characters is kind of, yeah, but, right, but right. about the history, though, you're right, yeah. Yeah, yeah, I mean, I think I agree with you, too, which is that, for me, the real, um, you know, in some sense, th that's what I really was arguing, is that the real drive for, for the anachronism is so that the brutalities of slavery and the brutalities of racism are do not seem as if they're periodized. They don't end, you know, I think back to Du Bois in Souls of Black Folk, where he's like, he's like, people, we, people assume that, you know, as soon as the immense, you know, as soon as the 14th Amendment happened, there would be freedom. And that that wasn't coming home. And in fact, that's how Du Bois puts it. He's like, there was no coming home. And I think that Whitehead wants to make a similar argument. So that when Cora and, you know, we know that she's probably in, you know, 19, I mean, excuse me, 18, I don't know, 656, but it also looks like she's entering into, you know, Tulsa, <laughs> um, she, Wilmington, you know, um, um, Charleston, um, she, it really feels like she's, oh, she's, she's coming above ground into any period of time. That's, for me, that's really the, the powerful part of the historical anachronism. Um, our next question is from Susan, uh, who's following up on what you were just speaking about. Uh, can you say more about the comparison with beloved ghosts versus the subterranean railroad here? Yeah, I think uh, I can get started. Um, I think it's, I want to emphasize the differences, I think. Um, uh, that is, I think there are two, two devices, right, of invention. Um, but I think they're being used in somewhat different ways. Um, and um, specifically, I think when I think about Beloved and I think about the title character and the idea of, you know, who, who is Beloved, right? And I think one of the things that Toni Morrison does is she multiplies the answers to that question. Um, yes, she's <laughs> Seth's daughter, you know, the murdered daughter returned. Um, but she's also a kind of, you know, when we get the, um, the first person narration there in the middle uh, or towards, you know, two thirds of the way through, right, we also get her as um, someone who came over on the middle passage, right? There's this kind of, um, you know, who am I, right? And, uh, um, and the answer to that seems to be, yeah, someone who survived uh, the Middle Passage. And then there's this other thing about, well, you know, there's a story that comes out about a, a, someone who's been in, uh, sort of held underground by a white man and for all these years and escapes, right? And I don't think, and, and Morrison sort of multiplies the, the meanings and doesn't ask us to choose, uh, I don't think. But the, the consequence of that, I, I, I think, does sort of, you know, places Setha's choice, not just about Setha, right? But about Setha in, again, in the history of, of slavery, right? Especially with the, with the Middle Passage and, um, and so on. And then I think, you know, for me, one of the things that's so powerful about Beloved is the way in which it's ending comes out as a challenge to the 20th century, 21st century reader, right? Um, we switch back to a, the present tense and uh, you know, this is not a story to pass on and so on. And the, the way in which um, Morrison has her narrator complicate that 
present tense thing. And basically in this really indirect but powerful way saying, you know, don't forget, don't forget. And, you know, and then, and then it ends with the word beloved which I think calls up all these meanings and, and so on and, and saying, you know, the, the, in this sense, there's something similar of the ultimate statement. Um, the legacy of slavery in the United States is still with us. Don't forget what are you gonna do about it? It kind of ends with a challenge, I think. Um, anyway. Yeah. You, yeah. You, yeah. Your turn. Uh, the only other thing I would I would say, and it's not really thinking about the uh, um, the Underground Railroad and the, the haunting, um, because in some sense they seem. I, I mean, I think we could both we could understand them both as a kind of gothic, right? You know, thinking about Toni Morrison, a kind of the the gothic of of the African American tradition. Um, but the other, th I guess, when I, the reason I was thinking about Beloved a lot when I was reading this novel um, is just because. Um, how central the matrilineal lineage is um, in the, you know, in the text. Like, so I describe the, the three women as being all picaresque heroes, but of course it's also a grandmother, a, a mother and a daughter. Um, and I think you, you and I were talking yesterday about how, um, how harrowing that last chapter with Mabel is, you know, when we find out that she was gonna go back. Um, and I, I, though, I guess the, what I was thinking about it was in relationship to beloved is that there can't be a remembering, right? So that part of what it is that, that, um, Whitehead wants to describe is, and of course, and, and, you know, in, in, this is a theme in, in all of Morrison's novels as well, which is the ruptures to genealogy, the ruptures okay. to inheritance that are, are, that, ha, that are the consequence of slavery, the consequence of, of racism, yeah. Yeah. Um, but the way in which it works out in this novel is that is that we readers, as you said, are privy to knowing about Mabel um, and that Mabel right. wanted to come, you know, was going to go back to her daughter. But of course, Cora can't be. So that historical story that might be exchanged from from mother to child, it, there, there can't be a remembering. It's just, yeah. you know, it is. It, it's something that you can't get back. Um, and so I was also thinking about that in th that yeah. relationship between Beloved and um, yeah. Yeah. Uh, um, and Underground Railroad. Yeah, yeah and just quickly uh, on the point of the comparison, right? I do think there's something strikingly different about sort of literalizing the metaphor of Underground Railroad, right? And then this uh, sort of more, um, you know, supernatural kind of thing with with uh, the ghosts and, and things like that. So it's sort of a, you know, Whitehead is going in the other direction of, of sort of making material um, and, and possible, you know, this this thing as, a, as an actual part of the world. Whereas I think with Morrison, we're staying in this idea of, okay, is the supernatural coming into the natural World. Right. Yeah, I actually think that that's really important is that part of what he wants, you know, part of the reason it's a focus on the on the real railroad um, is that, you know, one of the things he wants to emphasize is this was a real thing that was bought, you know, purchased and made by real people. It was yeah. financed by, you know, buying and trading people that that in large measure he's making an argument about, I think I called it an uh, economic dynamo, um, which maybe was a little bit obscure, but what I really mean to say is that there's no, you, the, the railroad um, is absolutely connected to the economic ex growth of the United States that was powered by slavery, that was powered by slave labor, the financialization of slaves, um, but, and he wants to really like, he wants to emphasize the real historical materialism of that. Yeah. I saw, um, Elizabeth, that somebody asked what, about the intuitionist and whether or not it exists in the same literary universe. I, I, and I'm just going to, I like that question a lot because I, um, because I do think that in many ways he wants us to be thinking about about the elevator and also the railroad as both technologies of transportation. Um, 
And actually there's, a, uh, I didn't talk about it, but in, there's that scene where um, Cora goes into the rail, into the elevator. The elevator. The yeah, station. and so, yeah. Um, and yeah. I mean, I, I think there's so much to be, I mean, and I, I don't know if, um, I just found this out maybe a year ago, the man who first took out the patent for the elevator was in fact actually an African-American man. And so there's a whole mm. kind of, you know, a whole other story about black history and elevators that I think that I think Whitehead is alluding to in the intuition. Yeah, um, yeah. so. <laughs> uh, our next question uh, comes from Christine. Uh, the last line of the book, uh, she wondered where he escaped from, how bad it was and how far he traveled before he put it behind him, seems to be able to open up conversations with present day relevance. What have modern day people endured? How bad was it, et cetera? Also begs the question, is it ever really behind someone? comment and a question <laughs> yeah no I, th I think that's a very good comment i think and um you know it is connected to the idea of the, again of the historical novel having you know relevance to the present day um i also think uh you know it's a it's a way of sort of within internal to the narrative of connecting core story with the stories of others right um what was what was his version of uh, you know the the journey that that got got him here right and you know one of the things that Beth and I mentioned yesterday that I think is relevant to bring in here is that he is um, you know he, he's he's writing a story about um, not not a sort of historically extraordinary sort of person right I mean Cora has some, you know, extraordinary qualities of character, I think, and, you know, we see that, um, although even that, right, he, he, he like when he uh, talks about when the, the narration of Cora's decision to um, come between uh, Randall and Chester, it's Chester, um, it's, it's before the slave part of her caught up with the human part of her, right? She's, she's intervening, right? So the, the point is that her, her taking this on, her putting herself between Randall and Chester is a human response, right? And, and it's extraordinary in a way, right? But also that Cora is not, um, you know, Frederick Douglass or, uh, you know, modeled on on someone like that, right? She's a she's this young woman um, who has you know these questions about her mother and so on, but she you know she, she decides to go off, right? And and then we see how her coping and the, you know doing that, and and so there's this you know story of a kind of ordinary, but in some ways you know distinctive kind of character. And then uh, the, part of the gesture at the end would be to say, okay, this is one of many, many stories. Um, and, you know, the, the Mabel story functions like that. And Ridgeway does too, in the sense of, you know, Mabel is the only one who got away. And, you know, so um, I, I, I think it, it helps sort of contextualize Cora's story within uh, a set of larger of larger stories, as well as, I think, as the questioner says, moving us to think about, you know, the future and the present. Yeah, I agree. I agree with all of that. I don't know how to read. I mean, I think the answer to, is it ever really behind someone is, of course, no. Um, the, the only thing I'm that I was thinking about, though, in, in reading the question is, um, I, I feel like it's um, the, the that moment where she gets on 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 that um, carriage or, you know, what's that called? Um, a horse and buggy. I don't, you know, she's a, tr a train. I don't know. It's not a train though. It's a, it's horses in a, in a, in a cart. Um, she, she they're going to communicate. They're going to tell stories. She wants, she, she wants to know what he's going to say. And I think, um, back to a moment in the novel where she's, um, she's in on the Valentine farm in Indiana. And we have that moment, which feels like real catharsis, where she tells Royal everything that's happened. She, we, we get told that she kind of rehearses her history. 
And I think we're supposed to understand it as a kind of a purgative, like um, that can't make it better, but at least it gives me some something like catharsis. Um, and I feel like by ending the novel that way, Whitehead is in some sense pointing to the fact that testifying, um, giving expression to, testi giving a testimony to, um, to how bad it was, um, how far you traveled um, is really, really important. Um, and to that end, I think it's really interesting that um, he talks about how important to the research was listening to those um, tapes and transcriptions of the federal writers project. Um, he, I, I told Jim yesterday, I read an interview where he says that was more important to him than even reading Douglas and Jacobs, because these were just, as, as, as you just said, ordinary people just being asked, you know, tell us about how bad it was, or just probably not, they probably the questioners didn't even speak it that way. They probably just said, tell us what it was like to be enslaved. And then they get to provide that testimony and that he really wanted to give expression to that testimony in this very detailed psychological portrait of, of Cora. Um, we have a comment from Susan. Uh, when I first heard about this novel and the fantastical subterranean railroad, I was concerned that I would not like it and was surprised he was able to use it to good effect. Uh, thanks for pointing out that some things were not in their his correct historical time frame, uh, e.g. the Tuskegee experiments. Um, and then uh, we also have a question about if either of you have seen the TV adaptation of this novel, and if so, what did you think? No, oh, I guess I'm, I'm in medias res with it. I've, I've seen some of the episodes, uh, haven't seen the whole thing, finished, finished watching the whole thing. Um, uh, but, you know, it's directed by Barry Jenkins, uh, who directed Moonlight, um, and it's, it's very powerful. Um, I would, you know, one of the reasons why I'm, I haven't binged it is because it's too, too much. Um, I think, uh, one of the things that's, you know, comes across in it, and maybe we could connect this to another point about the novel, is that when, you know, you give the visual image of things like, you know, lynching uh, or, you know, punishing some, a, a slave who's run away and come back, right? The, the visual representation of that is even more intense than the kind of descriptions you get in the, uh, in the novel. Um, and I think that, that maybe we could connect that to another issue, which is how Whitehead um, you know, handles the representation of the horrors of slavery, um, and especially, you know, for a 21st century audience, right? Um, and I think, you know, he doesn't pull punches, right? I mean, uh, the, the experiences of um, the enslaved people on the Randall Plantation, you know, pretty horrible. Um, and, you know, and the attitudes they've run into, et cetera, et cetera. Um, the violence, the violence, right? Um, yeah, I think he's, you know, um, he's, he's really trying to navigate a very fine edge, yeah. which is to give um, accurate and adequate representation to um, to the violence um, and to the horrors of slavery um, and racism, you know, and post, you know, the Tuskegee experiment, forcible sterilization, you know, riots, all of that. He wants to give, he wants to make these things tangible to us, but he's really mindful of not wanting to turn it into um, to theater, into something that's this just just something that is gazed upon. Um, right, just this kind of spectacle uh, yeah. uh, again and again and again. Right. right. Yeah. Um, and I know, I mean, I have not seen the, I haven't seen the show yet. I, I, I want to see it, but I, I haven't, um, I haven't um, been able to, but I know from, there was a, I think it, I think it's in like the Smithsonian Magazine. There's a, an article about it and it, and it kind of talks 
um, with both Jenkins and Whitehead and about both of them really being mindful of that, of not wanting to turn the camera into this kind of voyeur, like, again, to, you know, not to, not to, um, keep trashing Uncle Tom's Cabin, but like to not turn it into these voyeuristic scenes of black pain, um, but instead actually to have a different purpose to these scenes. Um, I don't know if it works or not. Um, I mean, I know that, you know, for example, um, in, in 12 Years a Slave, you know, there were audience, there were people who watched that movie who felt like that wasn't accomplished. Um, um, so I don't, I don't, I haven't read any reviews of, of Underground Railroad to know whether or not people have actually felt like they did that well or not. But it's, I'm, I'm eager to watch it um, for lots of reasons, but. <laughs> well, we just have a couple minutes left. Uh, so uh, Jim and Beth, if you'd like to give um, some just brief closing remarks to wrap us up. Beth, since I went first, okay. the beginning, why don't you go first? Yeah. I, I don't, I, I have, um, uh, I don't have anything scripted at all. I, I mean, mostly I just wanna encourage everyone to read um, uh, Whitehead's, all of Whitehead's work. <laughs> um, and then also, I guess to, you know, to read the, he's, he's making, um, he, as a, I would love to, I have never taught this novel, but I would love to teach this novel as a way to kind of do almost a mapping of African-American literary history of the 19th century, because he's making so many allusions to so much of the work of the 19th century. Um, and I just think it's, it's, it's really just kind of extraordinary. The, it's what, this is one of those novels, the more times I read it, the more I think he accomplishes. Um, and so I, I just, I encourage everyone to read more Whitehead. That's, that's really how, yeah. how I'll conclude. <laughs> yeah, yeah, and, and that connection, I think, uh, you know, the, maybe the next place to go, if you want to go forward rather than back to the intuitionist or zone one is uh, Nickel Boys, which is another historical novel um, you know, we're moving like to the turn of the century, uh, the previous century, nineteenth uh, uh, to twentieth, and um, you know he does some really interesting things. But it's it's much more in the realm of um, you know typical quote unquote typical historical uh, mm -hmm. fiction. There's not we don't have the fantastic uh, elements and and things like that. Uh, but he does some other really interesting uh, narrative narrative things. I think the other thing I would say is that you know, in this connection, um, Whitehead is somebody who um, I think is demonstrates the power of a, a literary fiction um, for potentially changing. Uh, ideas in our culture. Um, I think he's a voice that is you know, as important as any of our politicians. Um, and it would be good if everybody <laughs> read and listened to Whitehead and, and he, were, he were sort of more central part of the conversation. But I think, you know, we think about Toni Morrison and she is now, she has become part of the conversation in a way. And I think Whitehead is on the verge of, of, of doing that as he seems to me her, her closest successor. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. That's maybe a good place to end. Yeah. Well, a big virtual round of applause and thank you to Elizabeth Hewitt and Jim Phelan for sharing your time and expertise with us here today. And thank you so much to everyone who was able to join us this afternoon. Uh, we appreciate your time and all of your thoughtful questions. And everyone, uh, stay safe and stay healthy, and we'll see you soon. And have a good evening. <laughs>